Um, today we start a, a, a new mini-series, I think, um, we'll call it, and we're calling it Space. We're looking at, um, just for a few weeks, asking a question or two that I think maybe gets um, just overlooked a little bit in our Christian faith. A couple of weeks ago, now I, um, while Jan was away, you know what it's like, what did they say? While the cat's away, <laughs> that's something like that. When, are you sure, Arthur? What did you say? When the dog's away, the cats will play. Yes, when the cat's away, the mice will play. So a couple of weeks ago, while Jan was in Canada, um, I had a day out in London with Joe. Um, and primarily, we were there for a bit of culture, of course. Um, we went to the Globe Theatre um, to watch a bit of Shakespeare. My knees are still kind of recovering from two and a half hours standing watching Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, we did a bit of exploring while we were in London. Um, but given we had a bit of time to kill at one stage, Joe suggested that we... We were close to it, so we go into the Tate Modern. For those who don't know, the Tate Modern is an art, art gallery, okay? Um, the Tate Modern, when we went in, had a couple of exhibitions on, uh, including an exhibition of the painter Mondrian. P.A. Mondrian, as I'm sure you are, you are all aware, and according to Google, is a Dutch painter regarded as one of the greatest painters of the 20th century. His exhibition, like this, had, had many very similar paintings to this one. This is, this is probably his most famous painting. As you know, this one's called... This one's... I'm dealing with heathens. <laughs> This one's called Composition in Red, Blue and Yellow. Not sure why. I have to say, it doesn't come in this frame. I put this frame around it just to make it look a little bit more classy, if you like. Um, I have to say, I am no art expert. I'll lay it out there. But there was a big queue to get in to see Mondrian's exposition. I didn't get it. I, I just don't see it at all. But as I say, I am no expert. And someone obviously sees something that I don't. In fact, this particular painting, without the really nice frame, just with a plain white frame, sold in 2015 for... Boom! <laughs> Nothing. $51 million. I've got a big canvas in my shed at home now, and I've, I've dug out the paint that we've got in the shed. Um, I've got kind of... I haven't got any red, so I'm kind of going for mushroom, aqua blue, and um, what do you call that stuff that goes on all the walls? Magnolia. That would be my version of it. Um, as I say, I'm, I'm just not getting it myself. But I really didn't feel that I could stand in the Tate Modern before this picture amongst the clamouring folks and say out loud, that's rubbish. <laughs> I, I couldn't do that. Uh, maybe that's fair enough. I mean, an art gallery is where folks go to appreciate art, and people who appreciate art obviously appreciate this guy's paintings. I, I, I kind of wonder if in some sense we see the church in a very similar light to that of an art gallery. Is church the place where we're meant to have all the answers? Is church the wrong place to be saying, I don't get that? Let me put it another way and ask, is church the place to be if we have doubts? The title for this mini-series is going to be Space, but expanding it for this talk, we're labelling this as um, a faith with space to doubt? Question mark. Are we allowed 
to have doubts about some of maybe what we read in the Bible? Are we allowed to have doubts about some of the teachings that we get on a Sunday or from maybe podcasts or whatever? What are we supposed to adhere to? Do we have to just go along with everything that's been said? I want to have a look at that this morning, this idea of is ours a faith with space to doubt or not? Um, So let's have a look, let's see where we get to. It feels to me a little bit like doubt seems to be a bad word in Christian circles. Like, Like if you're starting to doubt, it feels like maybe you're starting to lose your faith. I mean, after all, we define doubt as a, a, a lack of, uh, uh, sorry, a feeling of uncertainty or a lack of conviction. And, and that element of doubt, it, it can be a regular part of our lives. Um, I was talking to Ken and Jill earlier, and um, was it Jill's son who'd done a marathon? If someone came up to me and said, would you do a marathon for charity, a really worthwhile charity? I might say, yes, but generally I'd have doubts as to whether I would finish or not. Now, in that case, doubt might kind of bring me down and go, no, I'm not doing it, or it might prompt me to prepare more thoroughly. You see, doubt being an actual day-to-day part of our life is potentially neither good nor bad. It's our response to that uncertainty that will determine whether it's good for us or not. But what about faith doubts? What about doubt concerning our faith and our relationship with God? Let me just throw this um, Stephen Furtick quote right out at the beginning. Stephen Furtick is a um, a preacher, well-known preacher. He says, don't assume that faith is the absence of doubt. Don't assume that faith is the absence of doubt. Maybe doubt is something we have to wrestle with. Maybe it would help if we turn to Scripture. And and if we're going to turn to Scripture, then who would be the first person we thought of when it came to doubting? Exactly, Asaph. Sorry, what did you say? Oh, let's go with Asaph. That was my first thought, obviously. The book of Chronicles tells us that Asaph, a Levite, was one of the three men commissioned by David to be in charge of the singing in the house of God. Asaph is a chief worship leader. He's in a privileged position. He's he's one of the the key men in the church, if you like. And Asaph is the guy credited with writing Psalm 73. Here's how that psalm starts. In my Bible, it reads Psalm 73, a psalm of Asaph. Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. That's a good start, don't you think? But note where this now goes. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. I'd nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They're free from common human burdens. They're not plagued by human ills. My feet had almost slipped. I nearly lost my foothold. Kind of feels like. His faith is slipping away. Doubt is creeping in concerning the value of serving God. This is like chief worship leader. This is the guy up front with a guitar. This is Matt Redman. Or who else is really well famous? Chris Tomlin. Those who are singers will know these names. They're all the songs that we sing. This is the worship leader. Doubt creeping in he kind of says those who don't serve those who don't kind of look to God they seem to be better off those who don't serve seem to be having a better time those who don't serve appear not to have any struggles maybe there's been a point in your life when you've kind of thought maybe I'd be better off 
not being a Christian. I mean, think about it. You could have all your Sundays off for one thing. You wouldn't feel tempted to put any money in the offering, but I know some of you don't feel tempted anyway. Only joking. Um, you wouldn't feel tempted to put any money in the offering bucket. You could put your feet up. You could go and do whatever you wanted, be that good, bad, or indifferent. Those kind of thoughts might lead us towards slipping, losing our foothold on our faith. That's Asaph. He's got these doubts. He's put them down there in the Bible. It's a song the guys were singing. They were singing, oh, God is good, God is good, but my feet nearly slipped because everybody else is better off than me. Let's turn our attention to another doubter. And of course, when we go to doubting, it's got to be. That's right, Mary. <laughs> the mother, we'll get to Thomas, I'm sure. Mary, the mother of Jesus. Luke reports how this angel comes to visit Mary. Um, we all know the story really well. Luke chapter 1, the Christmas story. The angel comes to tell her that she's been chosen to carry the Son of God. And Mary, reasonably, I think, is confused, puzzled. Luke says, in uh, Luke 1.34, Luke says, Mary was greatly troubled at the angel's words. Of course she was. And then she expresses this. How can this be? How can this be? I don't think Mary is looking for a scientific explanation about how a virgin can be pregnant. I think she's expressing doubt. She's doubtful about what she's being told. This is Mary, the most blessed woman of all. And she has doubts. How, how can this be? And listen, the angel, if you read the story, the angel doesn't say, well, if you're not sure, I'll move on to somebody else. I kind of need somebody who's rock solid sure. The angel doesn't say, oh, fair enough, I'll find somebody else. Edith over there. Jocelyn. She does, the angel doesn't move on to somebody else. So maybe if we have doubts, then we're in good company. Asaph, the worship leader, one of the top men in the temple, Mary, the mother of Jesus. But why did they have doubts? And are doubts always a bad thing? Why do we doubt? I think there's a number of reasons why we probably do doubt from time to time. First one is um, there are questions that we just can't answer. I mean, take the creation story, for example, in Genesis. I know some of you guys have got all this totally in here, but I'm not sure I have. And if an astrophysicist came up to me and said something, I'd probably say for a start, as I don't know what you're talking about, but if they came to me, an astrophysicist, and said, how can you square the Bible's creation account with what we now know as fact about the origin of the universe and the Big Bang? I mean, there might be an answer to that. And some of the kind of more intelligent... I'm kind of looking around for the more intelligent people, but there are, some, there are one or two in here who might have a good answer to that. But I don't necessarily know all the answers. I don't think I'm intelligent enough to totally get to grips with it. So I may doubt elements of the creation account. Is that okay? In the past, I've heard people say, the Bible says it, and I believe it, and that settles it. But honestly, sometimes I think it's a little more, a bit more complicated than that. So that's one reason we might doubt we don't have all the answers. Secondly, 
we might be prompted to doubt a tad when we come across situations that seem unfair, when bad things happen to good people. Or, or as Asaph, the psalmist, talks about, when good things happen to bad people. Or I prayed, and it just didn't seem like God came through. Maybe at the worst of these times, it, it's not unreasonable, unreasonable to think that, that we have a faith, or, or our faith has, has gone a little bit askew. Or God is less bothered about me. Maybe that's a fairly natural reaction. I mean, we all like things that are cut and dried, black and white, yet very often the way of God doesn't seem to work like that. That's the second reason we might doubt. Thirdly, sometimes there are hurts that we can't resolve. And how can I really have faith if I'm holding on to something that happened in the past? I doubt my faith will ever be strong enough. I doubt I will ever be good enough for God. Or how about, I struggle to believe that he forgives me. Not for what I did before I accepted that, him, I get that, but for what I still do. Maybe we doubt a bit about that. Listen, if we doubt, we're in good company. So let's look at what happened to our two protagonists. We've got Asaph, worship leader. He's wondering if he would be better off just jacking it all in and doing what others were doing. Here is his response. You see, Asaph doubted, but he didn't let doubt fester. He didn't allow it to cause him to fall. Instead, he went into the temple bringing his troubled thoughts before God. In Psalm 73, we read the start of it, Asaph says, when I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply till I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. When he did, when he entered the temple of God, he began to understand the destiny of the wicked. He began to understand that their prosperity was real, but it was only temporary, and it would end in destruction. Their life might feel like it's good now, but it would not last. I think this is really important to us. We can doubt. We do maybe doubt from time to time. Asaph doubted, but his doubt didn't keep him away from church. He didn't think, I'll sort all this out in my mind. I'll get it all in here. I'll, I'll get everything squared up, everything in line, and then I'll go to church. You see, his doubt, it had led him to the brink. It led him to the brink of saying, maybe I'd be better off without my faith. But he took his doubt to God rather than walk away. And God helped him to see that God himself was enough, was sufficient for him. And he was strengthened by that insight. His doubt actually helped him to grow in his faith. Then we got Mary. In a similar way, we see God working despite Mary's doubt Think about it like this. The greatest gift that God gave to Mary was on the other side of her doubt. He didn't withdraw his offer or change his mind about her carrying his one and only son. The greatest, God that, the greatest gift that God gave to Mary was on the other side of her doubt. So maybe if we do doubt, maybe we're in good company. And talking of doubting and good company, let's look at one other person filled with doubt. And seeing as you keep banging on about him, let's have a look at the disciple Thomas. I think Thomas has got a really bad rap throughout history. He's known as um, 
what would you call him? What's his nickname? You see, everybody knows he's known as Doubting Thomas. I'm not sure that's fair on the guy, but let's have a look. Let's decide. So, Thomas. And as we read, I want you to bear in mind that that, um, Thomas had been handpicked by Jesus, okay? Just a little while earlier, Jesus in going, um, right, I need 12 people. Let's say he picked all men, because he did, but that was the culture of the time. He probably went around and said, I'll have you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and I'll have you, Thomas. Like of everybody Jesus could have picked, Thomas was one of them. Doubting Thomas. So, had Jesus made a mistake? Did he pick the wrong guy? John 20 um, is recording what happened right after the resurrection. So literally, Jesus has been crucified. This is the Sunday after Resurrection Sunday. And John records on the evening of that first day of the week, Sunday evening, Easter Sunday evening, the same day that Jesus left the tomb, on that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After this, after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, his, his wounds. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Now, Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But Thomas said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. (coughs) Thomas would have been great on casualty, wouldn't he? You know, I'm not sure I would have been saying those things, but Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, what? I will not believe. Thomas says, I won't believe unless I see and touch. Doubting Thomas. Yet the only reason the other disciples were believing was because they'd seen him. They were pretty much doubting up to that point as well. Don't forget, they locked themselves away before Jesus appeared to them. We don't know why Thomas would doubt the word of the other disciples, and so we give him this bad rap, doubting Thomas. We don't know why he would doubt the words of his friends, but maybe he had good reason. Maybe Thomas had had disappointments in the past. Maybe he'd had some heartaches. Maybe there were things that he hung his hopes on that didn't work out. Maybe we've all been there. I remember kind of years ago applying for jobs and you know, writing up, sending off the CV, getting interviews, going for several interviews and thinking, I've really nailed this. You know, I'm the right man for the job. Um, The interview went really well. I got on really well with the people. It's a nice place. I love it. All that just to get a rejection letter a few days later. And nowadays, I think you don't even get a rejection letter necessarily. It just goes by the by. And after a few of those kind of interviews and getting rejected, just doubting I would ever get a good job. It's maybe a natural thing. Maybe Thomas had gone through similar emotions. Or maybe Thomas was a lot more intelligent than we give him credit for. The well-known Bible scholar Oswald Chambers says, Doubt is not always a sign that a man is wrong. It may be a sign that he's thinking. I think that's something to think about. Doubt is not always a sign that a man is wrong. It may be a sign that he's thinking. The story of Thomas moves on. John records, a week later, a week after Jesus has appeared on 
Resurrection Sunday. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Hooray! Finally, though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, I kind of heard what you were saying. Here's your chance. Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. I'm not sure at that point, as I say, I'd have probably gone, yeah, no, I, I don't have to do that. I get it. That's all right. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Seven days later, when the disciples were all together again and Jesus shows up for the second time, Thomas is with them. You see, Thomas had doubts, but he was still there. He was still with the other disciples. Despite the doubts, he showed up. I don't think his doubts evaporated during the week. He still has them. And how does Jesus respond to this doubter? Jesus comes to Thomas and he gives him exactly what he needed. Go on then. You want physical proof? Here it is. You see, God is not distant in our doubts. Jesus is not a standoff saviour. He's not kind of on one side going, when you get it sorted out, then we'll get back together again. Then we'll start talking. He's not like that. And your doubts don't disqualify your faith. Faith is not the absence of doubt, but the means to push through it. And God can use your doubt to, to draw you to himself. But you don't stay in the valley of doubt. That's the kind of the thing. You don't let doubt be your dead end. When in doubt, you just have to keep showing up. You have to keep asking questions. You have to keep trying to trust God. And you don't have to have faultless faith. Just a little bit of faith. I think it might be more common than you think to have doubts about our faith. Many people would say, the closer I get to God, the more questions I have. But we have this tendency to think that, that I'm the only one, so I, I kind of push that down a bit. And if I begin to express my doubts, what's everybody else going to think about me? The thing is that faith grows through our doubts. Our doubts handled properly can be a catalyst to a stronger faith. They don't have to take you away from God. Your faith can include doubts. Your faith is a journey with maybe bumpy doubts along the way. It's a journey, not a destination. So, in like one minute, let me give you a few quick tips for when you have doubts. Number one, never base your belief on your circumstances. We've all been there. You know when you're feeling low, you can be really irrational. Have you ever been like that? Have you ever been at that stage when you're kind of feeling down and you let, get a little bit upset with your spouse? And you, kind of, you know it's not right, but you're kind of a little bit irrational. So never base your belief on your circumstances. Number two, turn towards Christ rather than turning away. He can handle the doubts. He doesn't want you turning your back and going, I'll sort it all myself first. I'll get it sorted. Sorted. I'm back, Jesus. And Jesus is like, we could have sorted that between us. Turn towards Christ rather than turning away. Number three, pay attention to the evidence. When Jesus confronts Thomas, he presents the incontrovertible evidence. Look at the facts. Number four, Accept the fact that not all your questions will be answered. 
Can I just throw it out particularly to anybody in our Connect group? When you start asking those difficult questions, just accept that sometimes we're going to go, <clears throat> let's move on. We haven't got much time because we don't know. We don't have all the answers. And finally, don't condemn yourself for having doubts. You're in good company. Asaph, worship leader. Mary, the most blessed woman of all time. Thomas, one of the 12, one of the most important men in history. We could also list King David. Can you remember King David said, why have you forsaken me? How long will you forget me? Forever? John the Baptist. John the Baptist, when he was in jail, waiting to be, eventually he would be beheaded, while he was in there, the disciples came and said, how are you doing? John the Baptist said of Jesus, just ask, are you the Messiah? Or should we look for another? It's kind of was a little bit of doubt in there. We're in good company. Let me close by going right back to the beginning of this talk and say, church is not a place where you have to have it all together. It should be the safest place in the world to ask the hard questions. And if you have doubts, it's far better to be part of a church than out in the world. And you will be very welcome in this church because the Christian faith is a faith with space to doubt. Can we pray? Father, I wonder as we pray, I wonder whether at some point all of us have had some doubts about our faith. Maybe tiny little doubts, maybe bigger doubts, maybe some even now are kind of thinking, well, there's stuff I don't really understand, things that don't seem to add up for me. And if anybody's in that position right now, Lord, would you help them? Would you help them turn towards you, to ask questions, to keep trusting? And would you help all of us to understand that doubt is part of life, it's part of who we are, it's part of our makeup, it's part of the world we live in. And actually it's okay for it to be part of our faith too. As long as we just continue to, to understand that the best place to be in our doubts is close to you. So help us with that. Help us to understand that church is the best place to be. That we do have a faith with space to doubt. Help us to all grow through this in Jesus' name. Amen.